All right, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. If you guys can move up to the front of the room, that'd be great. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Van Bossa, who I've known for almost 10 years now. And I fly from California to see him in Philadelphia. He's been on our medical advisory board, on the AMCSI board. He ran the Arthrocoposis Symposium, which is every four years, first time in the US. And he puts his heart and soul into these kids. And Ani said I could say whatever I wanted in this introduction. So I'm also going to include um, that he was our biggest cheerleader when my daughter took her first steps. And he is probably the reason we adopted her brother with arthroposis, because I knew he'd be in good hands. Please introduce Dr. Van Bassa. All right, are we on? Oh, good. Thank you for coming. So let's talk about arthrogryposis. Um, hang on, so we're doing a weird little two thing here. I have to advance my own slides in both uh, places, so if I look confused, it means that I'm not catching up here. So arthrogryposis is a, uh, a term where arthro means joint, gripe means curved, multiplex means multiple joints, and congenda means that these were all, the, the contractions were present at birth. We called AMC just because it's an easier way to talk about, it, but also people sometimes are shorthanded as arthrogryposis. All those things mean the same thing as somebody's born with contractures of multiple joints. And then when we talk about it, we always like to bring up this picture. There's things about the size of a sheet of notebook paper, and it hangs in the Louvre in uh, Paris. But it is uh, what was thought to be the first picture of a kiddo with arthrogryposis that's documented. If you look at the different joints, so the, the contraction of his, of his wrist there and his fingers, his club foot over there, these all look very much like somebody who's got arthrogryposis. And we suspect that underneath his uh, sleeves, is, he's also got elbow extension contractures and maybe some knee contractures. But the first documented uh, discussion or, or description of arthrogryposis goes back to 1841. This guy by the name of um, Adolf Otto uh, and he described it, if you think that you know, kids these days are uh, given bad labels, here was a human monster with inwardly curved extremities. So we've come a long way since talking about that, but this is what the kids that we treat look like. And what do we always tell parents? That they always look their worst when they're born, and then they gradually unwind and look better and better. So we always try to reassure parents in the very beginning that what you see initially is not what's gonna uh, be the kiddo that grows up. What we frequently hear is parents coming in saying, well, we were told our kiddo won't walk. Uh, and that I think is a real shame, but part of it, you can, you can understand that somebody who hasn't seen arthrogryposis before might think that this kiddo here won't turn into that kiddo, or that this one here won't turn into that kiddo. Uh, and similarly, the kiddo with the hips like these won't be this kiddo over here. You know, that they don't have the experience to understand what can be done with these children, what potential they have if you provide them with the right set of circumstances. So, uh, an illustrative case here, this young lady is actually at a conference, which is wonderful. So this is Sophie, this is what she looked like when her parents adopted her and when I first met her. This is how much her hips moved. Um, and so we did a procedure on those to get those to get her to sit better. There she is now being able to sit with her legs more side by side. This is how much her knees moved when I first met her. So we got them straightened out with what's called an Elizaroff external fixator. And here she is standing in her Easter dress. And this is actually uh, one of the first times that she was walking with her long braces. So she was showing off for us. So uh, Arthur Gray Post has gone through a lot of different names, uh, multiple congenital contracture syndrome, um, then Rosencrantz called arthrogryposis a little more than a century ago. Uh, Stern was the guy who gave us the full long name. And then there was uh, Sheldon, we'll come back to that name a little bit more, who, who uh, just tried to, who came up with the name, sorry, of uh, amyoplasia. We'll be talking about amyoplasia. And then Judy Hall, that many of you have heard of before, uh, is really, in my mind, the grand dame of arthrogryposis because she has published so much and she's done so much research and really helped us understand this condition a whole lot more. And is still, as a person who's retired like 20 years now, still extremely active in the field. 
And it was Judy Hall who gave us this definition that arthrogryposis is a congenital condition. Again, you're born with it. Non-progressive limitation of two or more body parts. So you have two or more joints uh, in different parts of the body that are contracted. So if you have a kiddo who's got uh, two hips that are out of socket, or maybe another kiddo who's got two club feet, that's not arthrogryposis. But if they have one club foot and one dislocated hip, that's two joints in different parts of the body that are affected, and that then reaches the, uh, the definition of arthrogryposis. But that makes a very broad uh, set of, of conditions that we're talking about there. So it's a descriptive term, it's not a diagnosis. The uh, way I like to talk about it is like saying you have a cold. Well, everybody knows that with a cold, you have a runny nose and you got the sniffles, you might have a sore throat, you might have a cough, but it doesn't tell us what's causing your cold. Is it a bacteria, is it a virus, is it just bad allergies? And same with arthrogryposis. There's a whole lot of different things that can cause arthrogryposis. Um, but the term itself, even though it's an easy way to talk about it, is not actually giving you a, di a diagnosis in a real sense. So the overall instance is about one in 3,000 births. Uh, but there's about 400 different things that can lead to somebody being born with arthrogryposis. What do they all have in common? Something called fetal akinesia, or lack of movement during pregnancy. So, for whatever reason, the child's not moving much during pregnancy, and that's what helps you form your joints. My favorite way to explain this, if you look at the back of your hand, you got your, at your finger knuckles, you got all these little wrinkles there. Well, those wrinkles are there because for most of us during pregnancy, we were moving our fingers back and forth. And when you bend your finger, you stretch the skin. You also get the tendon to run through its tendon track. You get the ligaments to, to set the right amount of, of uh, rotation, right amount of elasticity. If you're not moving them, everything gets tightened up and nothing moves. And that's when you get yourself into trouble. Uh, now, what about when does this happen? Well, first, let's talk a little bit about the stages of pregnancy. From an orthopedist like me, we just break it down to two very easy categories. There's the embryologic stage, which is the first two months of pregnancy. This is when the baby is getting put together. You got two cells, one from mom, one from dad. They get together and they, over time, multiply and replicate and do all these other cool things that creates a little rice bean that is a, a, a miniature human. And then during the fetal stage, the next seven months, that's when this little rice bean becomes a full-grown person. And it's during that time, it's during the, the uh, fetal period, that things go wrong. So the baby is developed appropriately. It, they're not malformed. But what happens is later on, things don't go ap appropriately. So they are, and excuse the expression, they are deformed. It's not a malformation, it's a deformation. Uh, and so the joint problems happen during this fetal period. And if you don't move joints around, joints get contracted. They become scarred, which is called fibrosis. And that's when the joints become uh, unusual. Uh, and then the other things that happen with the skin. So we talked about uh, the skin creases that you get when you're moving your joints. If you don't move them, you don't have any skin creases. It's very smooth across the areas. And you could also end up uh, with, there we go, dimples. And these dimples happen because when the skin's not moving over the joint, it gets stuck down to the underlying uh, joint. Um, and you can also have other issues that happen if you're not moving around very much during pregnancy. So w during pregnancy, all babies swallow. They swallow the amniotic fluid. They breathe in the amniotic fluid. And that's what gives the lungs and the gut some training. So if you're not doing that very much, you end up with a small jaw. You can end up with... Uh, digestive issues, you can end up with um, lung issues. So small jaw is called micronathnia. Uh, you can have oligohydramnius or polyhydramnius, either too little or too much uh, amniotic fluid. Uh, the gut motility problems like we talked about. So a lot of uh, the kids that we see with arthrogryposis have constipation issues. And also lung issues like we talked about, pulmonary hypoplasia, that the lungs aren't formed well. And oftentimes they can also have a short umbilical cord. Oddly enough, that kicking around that little babies do, they're kind of swimming around the uterus a little bit, and that stretches out the umbilical cord some. If they're not doing that as much, the umbilical cord can be short, and that can have its own set of issues. There's a very severe form of this called Peña-Shokir syndrome, um, and we're not going to go into this very much, but it, it's just probably the most severe side of not moving around very much intrauterally. And unfortunately, these kids usually do not survive. 
But here's a much happier uh, kiddo. This is Harper. This is what she looked like when she was born over on your right there. So we did an operation at her hips to get her hips uh, pointed forward. And here she is uh, on her way to school. And I think there's a video of, that her mom sent me early on when she first started walking. And what I enjoy about this is that how, how adaptable these kids are and how they figure out how to do things for themselves. So at the very end here, Harper's gonna show you how she sits down. Boom, just like that. That worked very well for her. So what are the causes of fetal akinesia? Well, there's a whole bunch of different causes there. There can be problems with the nervous system, anywhere from the brains to the, uh, the nerves going down to the muscles themselves, um, such as in these different conditions here. It could be spinal cord issues. There could be issues with the connective tissues so that actually the things that are developing your muscles or your ligaments are not born with enough elasticity, so they're very tight things like these pterygium syndromes. Or they can have abnormalities of the muscles themselves, or for some reason the muscles are put together in a way that they're not actually working, that they're not making joints move. And then there can be also some of the, the pregnancy-related type issues. So we're going to talk about that first, because that's early on in my career. I don't hear, hear that as much now, but it used to be early on in my career that a lot of parents were coming uh, to me and they would say, well, yeah, we know that it's, uh, you know, the mom's fault, uh, you know, something that mom did and mom doesn't know what it was. And that's really unfair and also very uncommon. The, um, the big complaint that, or the big concern everybody has is there's not enough room in the uterus for the baby. And you can sometimes get this with some uh, uteruses that have structural abnormalities, such as those that have fibroids, or at the bottom there, you have something called a bicornate uterus. On the left is a normal shaped uterus, on the right is a bicornate uterus. And it's just, it's a cramped area there. But the thing to understand about that is that the, the most of the kids that we're seeing, that you see at this conference here who have arthrogryposis, their issues happen much earlier on in pregnancy. Uh, so around this, um, 8 to 11th week is where we see most of those changes happen. So very early on, they were not moving around. Whereas when you're talking about lack of room inside the uterus, that happens much further on. If it, um, if it happened earlier, uh, sorry, let me figure out a different way to say it. If this was an issue of crowding, then you'd figure that every time uh, twins were born, one or both of them would have arthrogryposis because that's a pretty crowded situation there. We're gonna talk a little bit about twins in a second, but my point being that if it's only due to having not enough room inside the uterus, those issues happen much further into pregnancy and those kids aren't as stiff. We can usually pick those kids out early on. Well, what about twins and multiple births? Well, it usually has more to do with the, uh, uh, if they share a placenta. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit too. Okay, what other mom issues do we have to think about? Well, there's infections or other conditions, uh, a number of infections that we do have to worry about, and this is why it's important to make sure that everybody has their immunizations. Zika is a, a, a more recent issue that we've learned about that causes arthrogryposis, but also things like multiple sclerosis, diabetes not as much, but occasionally. Myasthenia gravis also can be related with, um, uh, with arthrogryposis. So these are kinds of things that if, uh, a mother knows that she has myasthenia gravis or uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, she needs to be talking very much to her obstetrician. And hyperthermia has also been related to it, uh, where apparently um, during pregnancy, if there's severe conditions where the temperature may, may rise too much, that moms can be in trouble. Some of the medications can cause this too, um, but these are medications that are of a concern anyway during pregnancy. And then we talk about vascular compromise, where there's not enough blood flow to the, the developing baby. And this, we think, is a very um, uh, important cause of arthrogryposis. And it can lead to some uh, placental issues. Uh, it happens a lot in, uh, in twins. So here, let's talk a little bit about this. So when you have identical twins, and oftentimes when they share the same placenta, what can sometimes happen is that one twin gets more of the blood flow than the other one does. And if it happens at a critical point where you're developing some uh, structures inside the spinal cord, that's when you can end up with one of those twins having arthrogryposis. So we see it mostly in twin pregnancies. We don't see it in fraternal 
sorry, so mostly in identical twin pregnancies. We don't see so much in fraternal twin pregnancies. But let's talk about, we're gonna talk about that again in a little bit. So let's get around to this. How do we classify arthrogryposis? There's different ways of doing it. So Dr. Hall likes to classify it in terms of disorders that are basically the limb involvement, and amyoplasia would be under that, distal arthrogryposis would be under that. And we'll explain what those conditions are in a little bit. Uh, you can have dis uh, conditions that affect the limbs and some other body parts, such as the, uh, the neck or the spine. So pterygium syndromes fall under that. And then in Dr. Hall's way of looking at the third uh, system would be, or the third uh, category would be kids who are born with disorders of the limbs or uh, and also something to do with how the brain works, so the central nervous system. Uh, the way that I like to do it, though, is, again, three sets of uh, uh, three different categories. The one is just amyoplasia. And the second one is the distal arthrogryposis. And the third is the everything else. And, the, and then uh, definitely the everything else has to be in time. We have to categorize that or subcategorize it better. But with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about amyoplasia. So amyoplasia is the most common form of arthrogryposis. It's about one-third of all kids, which is why it's the only thing in that first category. And it happens about one out of every 10,000 births. It's not inherited. It's sporadic. Um, and the kids usually are very symmetrical in their limb positioning. So uh, if one elbow is affected, the other elbow is most likely infected. If, uh, if they have um, a club foot on one side, they probably have a club foot on the other side. And what you find is the muscles are replaced with, with this very uh, thick, fat, fibrous kind of scar, fat type tissue. Uh, but even though their muscles aren't working well, their sensation works very well. And that's one of the things we, we all have to be very cognizant of when we're treating these kids. And they, by and large, all have normal intelligence, if not even above normal intelligence. Uh, they have a decreased overall muscle mass. Um, and they have this kind of what we call a fusiform appearance to their limbs, which means that the limbs start out kind of wide and then cone down. Uh, they lack joint uh, skin creases. They'll have the dimpling that we talked about. And if we look at their skeletal, if, we, if we're operating on them and they're actually looking at where their muscles should be, what you find is what looks like fat tissue, only it looks like it's aligned like, uh, like you'd expect muscle to be. So instead of being red tissue, it's yellow, but it looks like, kind of like you would expect muscle to be. So it was actually that muscle tissue that just got um, replaced by fat tissue over time. Very often we'll also find there we go. We'll also find these funny little barbershop stripes on these kids. And this, we think, is actually their umbilical cord that got wrapped around a leg. And recently, I had uh, a family send me an MRI of their baby, and you can see exactly that. Here's the umbilical cord coming around, and you can see how it's wrapped around this child's legs. Now, what that exactly means, if that is a part of the cause of their arthrogryposis, or the other way around, just because they're not kicking like a, a typical baby is, they can't unkick the, um, the umbilical cord from the other leg, uh, not really sure. The one thing is that these, uh, these clefts that we see here don't seem to be much of a danger. It's not that it needs to have anything done to get rid of those clefts. Uh, when we look at other MRIs, we can look deeper in the tissue, everything looks okay. In the upper extremities, we tend to find that the shoulders are turned inwards, the elbows tend to be extended or straight, and the wrists and fingers tend to be kind of flexed uh, underneath. So this is called uh, a waiter tip position. Uh, for the lower extremities, the, uh, the hips are bent, they're turned outwards, uh, and about uh, um, anywhere from uh, one out of six to one out of three can be dislocated. Uh, and then the knees, they can be bent or extended, and the feet usually only have the club foot deformity. Now, it's interesting that most of the kids will have all four extremities that are involved, but you will have some, and we, have, we see that here around us. We also, there's some adults that were uh, in some of the sessions earlier uh, who only have one set of involvement. So either the lower limbs are involved along with good uh, upper limbs, or only the upper limbs are involved where the lower limbs are well formed. And about 30% of these kiddos will also have some sort of spine involvement. And very often, it'll, they'll be born with a curve to their spine, 
and the curve to their spine will look very much like how they were laying inside their mop. That if they were laying on their side, they get a curve that kind of mimics that. And for a long time, that curve will stay stable until they get of a certain age. Uh, around puberty, will, it'll progress, and we need to do something about it. Uh, the trunk usually is normal, but sometimes you'll have these kiddos who are born with what's called a midline defect, that they're, uh, either the muscles of their abdomen are not developed, and that can be something called prune belly syndrome, or they're born with uh, the skin didn't completely come together in front, and it sounds ugly, but their bowels are born outside their body. Uh, and then a quick note about that, that's actually something that's very easy to take care of uh, and to treat um, as soon as they're born. What are other things that we find? You guys are probably aware of this, is the, uh, that the, the um, what I call the little orthogryposis headlight, that little red blotch that they have on their forehead or their nose or their chin. And it's actually uh, given a name of a, 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 a nevus flamus. Uh, they can also have underdeveloped jaws. Uh, and then in the genital area, uh, the girls can have underdeveloped labia, and the boys can have crypt orchidism, which means that the, the testes didn't go all the way down to the scrotum, or they can have inguinal hernias. Uh, and there will actually be later on, there's a talk on urology of arthrogryposis, which I think is pretty important and kind of a, a, an area that we just only recently have started to become aware of. So what's the cause of amyoplasia? Well, we think the leading theory is that something happens early on in pregnancy. So it's right after the embryologic period, about eight to 11 weeks after, the embry after uh, uh, pregnancy started, that there is an interruption of blood supply uh, to the developing baby. And it happens at a critical point when you're trying to create what are called the anterior horn cells. So you got your brain, you got nerves that go from the brain down your spinal cord, and within the spinal cord, they connect to the nerve that goes down to the muscle. So there's this little junction point between the spinal cord nerve and the nerve going out to the muscle. And that junction happens at something called the anterior horn cell. Uh, and what, what we have found, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that whole process works, but we, we see this more often in twins, and that made people start thinking well, that it, it had, wasn't a genetic thing because identical twins share all the same DNA uh, information, so it had to be something else that was going on, and particularly we found it was in identical twins who shared a, a, a placenta. That's what we started thinking about, one twin getting more blood than the other, and that's the, the other twin who got in trouble. Also, have, it's been uh, seen to occur in mothers who had a hypotensive period during pregnancy, that something happened early on in pregnancy where their own blood pressure dropped and probably affected the, uh, the baby. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. So what I just outlined here, brain is sitting up there, you come down the spinal cord, that's that red dot here. Here we've kind of taken a cut through the spinal cord that we're looking down on. And this is the front or the anterior part of the spinal cord where you got that red circle, which is the, um, the anterior horn. By the way, is it, is it echoey for you guys as it is for me? It is, this is terrible. Hey Mike, can we do something about the echo? I was hoping it was only me that was bothered by that. Okay, so here's our, here's our nerve coming down. Here's the anterior horn cell. Or sorry, that's a, this, is, this is the anterior horn cell. Here's nerve coming down, it connects to the anterior horn there, and then it goes to the muscle. So if this doesn't form, then you have no connection between those two nerves. And so you don't have uh, the message getting down to the muscle that we have to have. So there's the anterior horn cell. So the question is, well, why do the kids look different? If this is what we think is what's underlying what causes a child with, arth with uh, amyoplasia, why do they look different? Why do only some have hands involved, others only have legs involved, uh, and why are some mild and some much more involved? Well, it seems to be the timing of when that, that problem happened, what I, what I call the, the vascular insult happened. Um, so babies start moving about at eight uh, weeks of uh, gestation, and they start moving from the head down, so the jaw starts moving before the arms start moving, uh, and they also start moving quicker on the right side than the left side, uh, interestingly enough. So if you have something that happens at about eight weeks, but it's a real pinprick of an injury, then only the jaw will be involved. If it happens just at the ninth week, then it's the upper extremities. If it happens at the 10th week, some upper extremity and some lower extremity involvement. 
And if it happens at the 11th week, it's only lower extremity involvement. But what happens if you have something severe that happens at the eight weeks and it's an ongoing process? Well, then it's going to involve everything. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about that second category, the distal arthrogryposis. So this involves primarily the hands and feet. Uh, there are, this is an old table of uh, the distal. Here there's only 11 uh, different conditions. Now there's thought to be about 19 of them, but we're still trying to figure that out. Um, and in the past, we used to think that it was one gene that caused one condition. But what we started to realize is, so you got this one gene here, this uh, MYH3, and you'll notice that it can cause both the, the classical arthrogryposis, also Freeman-Sheldon syndrome, Sheldon-Hall syndrome, also shows up in this arthrogryposis type 8. So the same gene, depending upon where that gene is affected, can lead to many different kinds of distal arthrogryposis. Uh, and the same with uh, this other gene here, this uh, PISO2 gene over there. You can see it both in the Gordon syndrome and in distal arthrogryposis type 5. Uh, and there's a few of these other genes that are going around. So what's going on here? Well, uh, first of all, arthrogryposis is an autosomal dominant uh, condition. What that means is that you only need one parent to have the, the abnormal gene that they can pass on for a child to have. You don't need to have both parents with it with an abnormal gene. It has reduced penetrance and variable expressivity, which is just a fancy way of saying it can present differently from parent to child to child to child to child. So it can, it can be uh, more or less involvement over time. Uh, and in the cases that we're going to talk about here, it primarily, the genes that we're talking about are primarily involved with the fast twitch muscles. I'm going to talk about that real quickly. There are two different kinds of the muscles in your skeleton, not to talk about the muscles in your abdomen or anything else like that, but uh, you either have the muscles that are your big strong muscles, like your upper arm muscles, or you have the muscles that allow you to do delicate and fine things, such as your hand muscles, you know, let you, let you play musical instruments. And those fine, uh, delicate type muscles are called the fast twitch muscles. And so the fast twitch muscles are primarily found in the hands and feet. And there's a type of fast twitch muscle that is only there very early on in pregnancy and then is replaced by more mature fast twitch muscle that you're actually born with. So if there's something wrong with that uh, embryologic fast twitch muscle, it's the one that stops the joints from moving well, and then you end up with the contractures, even though the muscle afterwards is working pretty well. So a real quick talk about how muscles work. You've got this chain, this chain of little purple beads, which are the uh, tropomyosin chain, and swirling around that, sorry, is it, is, I'm sorry, the, the, the chain of the purple beads is the actin. Swirling around that is this band called the tropomyosin, which is covering up these little yellow uh, sites over here. And then you have this thing called troponin, which is sitting over here. Down here, you got this, this big snake over here, which is the, the myosin. So what happens is that you have an, a molecule of calcium that hits the troponin, which causes the troponin to change its shape, which then causes the tropomyosin to change its shape, which uncovers those little yellow dots that we talked about. And then the, the green monster, the myosin, bams into that, and then the muscle moves. So every time you're moving something, there's this whole chain of events that happens. It's, it's really amazing to think of how fast this occurs. But with that in mind, any of, this, any of these little pieces here can be goofed up, and that will stop how the muscle works. So we can have problems with the, the uh, troponin or the tropomyosin or the myosin. Any of those pieces can be affected. And here we talked about it. So in SHS, is Sheldon Hall syndrome, the troponin, uh, to, the troponin subunits can be involved, so they can be not working appropriately. In Friedman-Sheldon syndrome, it can be what we call the, the, the big green snake over here. It can have its uh, parts that are not put together correctly. Uh, and then there's this great one called trismus pseudocampylodactyly syndrome, which is just fun to say, but here it's also it's a myosin issue. So there's a, a bunch of different little things. There's just one little component of this wonderful machinery. If it's not working right, you can end up with this big condition. So underneath uh, the dysorthogryposis, we have some called uh, the classic dysorthogryposis. And so they have these hand shapes, very common, where the, the thumb's inside the palm and the fingers are kind of over and the fingers are spread over to the, the uh, outer side of the palm. They also get club feet. 
Uh, then you have the, what's called Freeman Sheldon syndrome, uh, or what's known as whistling facey syndrome because their mouth is kind of puckered. And they have a number of other facial findings. Uh, they also get club feet. And, they also, and both of these conditions, or all these dysarthric arthrosis conditions, can also get a congenital vertical talus, which we'll be talking about in a second. It's kind of the opposite of the club foot. <coughs> Pardon me. And then there's Sheldon Hall syndrome, which for a long time was thought to be the same thing as Freeman Sheldon syndrome. And so they started realizing that a lot of kids with Sheldon Hall just looked different. They weren't quite as involved. They didn't have as much scoliosis, for example, or as much of the facial findings. And they then realized it was a different condition. Uh, and then a completely different thing called Beal syndrome, the, uh, where most our kids with arthritis gryposis are short. <coughs> kids with Beal syndrome are actually quite tall and lanky, and they look very much like kids with uh, Marfan syndrome, except that uh, they have these hand contractures. And then there's the third category, which is the everything else. And there's a whole bunch of different things in here, and it's hard to kind of pick everything out. But I did want to talk real quickly about the pterygium syndromes, because we see a fair amount of those. So pterygium is a, a fancy word for saying webbing, and it kind of looks like, it, the root word looks like pterodactyl. So you see where that comes from, winging or webbing. So you get these thick, abnormal, uh, uh, soft tissue structures uh, behind the joints or in front of the joints. Most of these are genetic conditions, such as Escobar syndrome. But you see that you have behind, on the, the lower left picture there, that um, knee has a, a webbing going on. Actually, also here, kind of in the crotch, this area here's got some webbing. This person's elbow behind the knee over there. Uh, and so the, the soft tissues are abnormally formed. They restrict the joint from moving, and that's when you end up with the joint that becomes uh, contracted like this child over here. So very thick webbing over there. Uh, and this, in this case, it seems to be a dysfunction of the acetylcholine receptor. Now, we talked about the nerve going from the spinal cord to the muscle. Now for the, that nerve to communicate with the muscle, there's a little gap and a little uh, chemical called acetylcholine has to jump the gap to cause the muscle to fire. And if on the muscle side, the part that's supposed to feel the acetylcholine doesn't sense it, then you're not gonna get that message across again from the brain and that muscle's not gonna work. So that's what we find in the kids with Escobar syndrome is that the acetylcholine receptor isn't working. So let's talk some about the treatment of arthrogryposis. Well, it's definitely a team approach. It takes everybody on this list to be part of the team to work together. And definitely the patient and the parents are at the top of the list for very good reason. And when we talk about the different kinds of things we could do for treatment, there's physical therapy, there's uh, splinting and bracing, uh, serial casting. We'll talk about all these things. Then you get to the surgical type things, doing things to the soft tissues to loosen them up, or sometimes doing things to the bones. So you're trying to adapt to the contracture and just get the, the, the limb to work better altogether. And we definitely have a number of different goals in mind when we're treating a child with arthrogryposis. So certainly from my standpoint, as a person who does lower extremities, uh, one of my top goals is getting kids up and walking. But there also has to be a realistic sense behind that, that not every child is going to have the ability to walk. And we have to be very cognizant that we're not going too far trying to push something that's not going to work and doing a lot of uh, surgery on a child or a lot of treatment on a child where that's not going to help them. So some important facts. Uh, all these children or most of these children are quite intelligent. Um, and they also are sensitive to pain. And a lot of treatment that we do is painful. So we have to be mindful. Uh, as a treating doctor, I have to be mindful of that. I'm not going to put them through a lot of things more than that, what they can tolerate. And we can't make this abnormally developed joint normal. We can't do that. What best we can do is try to adjust around it to try to help us uh, get the child to function better. And there's also a, a variable spectrum of how arthrogryposis presents. And you just see this in this conference, right? That you have kiddos who are very mildly involved in certain joints and kids who are much more significantly involved. So there's no cookbook answer for any child. And also the children are very smart at learning how to compensate. So we want to do two things. One, we don't want to take any compensation away from them if it works very well. 
But also we want to realize that if we have a child who's trying to compensate with the way they are and we give them, put them in a position where things might work out better, they're going to learn to compensate to this new position as well. So no single best answer and everything I'm going to talk about from here on out is basically my opinion or things I've learned from other people. And that can change with experience and with learning. And one of my favorite sayings is good judgment comes from experience. And unfortunately, a lot of that comes from bad judgment. Uh, and certainly the other thing is that every kid is an individual. We have to look at them in that way and, and try to figure out what works for them. But if we're going to try to draw some general uh, guidelines out of this to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about the foot, the hip, and the knee, because that's the order that I like to treat these in. And if I have complete control over the timeline, the foot I would, I would start to address uh, soon after I first meet them when they're born. The hip's usually about 12 to 18 months, so a year to year and a half. And then the knee flexion contractures at about four years of age. Uh, so let's start talking about the feet first. So the feet come really in two varieties. You have the club foot, which has got this big long name, the telepus equinovarus foot, and the congenital vertical talus. So on top is the club foot, and the bottom is the, the uh, congenital vertical talus. Um, and if we take a real quick look at uh, the non-arthrogripotic club foot and see what's happened with that over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, traditionally, the treatment that I learned in um, residency was that we would cast these kids for several weeks uh, and then we take to the operating room and essentially take their whole foot apart like you're seeing over here and put it back together, lengthen all the tendons and everything, um, and then hopefully the foot would do well. Uh, but what happened was that a lot of the feet would become stiff, and this is the, the non-arthrogripotic feet, just the typical feet, they become stiff and they get recurrences, uh, and oftentimes that could lead to very big problems. And you gotta remember that the ultimate goal with these feet, uh, particularly arthrogripotic feet, is to have a foot that's braceable, a, a foot that's uh, flat to the ground, and we do that with the least amount of surgical treatment and try to keep the chances of recurrence as low as possible. This was a uh, algorithm that was published uh, now more than 20 years ago where they said, well, this is a treatment for the kids with um, amyoplasia and club feet. And so what they said is, well, you go up there, you start casting them, and then we do our surgery, we do some more casting, we put them in our splints. And if we do really well, they come down here on the left side, we get our good results. But if they don't well, do well and they get a, uh, a recurrence, well, then we'll have to do some surgery over here um, and then different kinds of surgery we can do. We can take out pieces of bone or we can cut through bone. And then ultimately we may end up with a fair result, but unfortunately a lot of them were poor results. And that's really important because three quarters of the kids with arthrogryposis would end up with uh, uh, recurrences. We're at five minutes already, oh boy, 10 minutes. All right, so looking at club feet, this guy here really changed our minds on a lot of things. This is Dr. Ponsetti who started talking about a different way to treat the idiopathic, the, the, the club foot of a child without arthrogryposis. And that was he who taught us different ways of casting these kids. And we started doing that for our kids with arthrogryposis. Uh, now, I made a few changes to the, uh, the procedure. I'm going to talk about those real briefly. But essentially, you do a number of casts. You change the cast every week or so. The, the, the schedule can be different from kid to kid. And at the end of the road, you just have to loosen up the Achilles tendon with, through a very small incision and get the foot in a good position. Uh, and that was just a matter of keeping them braced. So what we changed around uh, is that in the arthrogripotic kiddos, particularly the ones who have really contracted feet, we sometimes would do that nick of the Achilles tendon early on instead of later in the game, just to loosen things up a little bit. And then we go ahead and cast them, possibly do a second Achilles tendon, uh, and then put them into a brace. Nowadays, to be honest though, I do most of my Achilles tendons at the end of treatment, uh, but there's still the occasional ones I'll do in the beginning, such as this child over here, very tight foot. The foot's really pointing down at the ground a lot, which we call Aquinas. And so the way that we do is we put a little bit of lidocaine right above the ankle there and take a scalpel and go right down to the Achilles tendon through a very small incision. You can see the size of the incision right up there. And we already get a little bit of improvement there and put them in their first casting and really see how much improvement we have from what we started to what we have over there. And there's just a, a number of casts further to get the foot into a good position. So you have feet that look like these, they can end up looking like feet like those with some casting. And then we have to do bracing. So with the typical club foot, the kiddo doesn't have arthrogryposis, these are the braces that I prefer for them. But in the kids with arthrogryposis, the problem is that you use those braces and their feet would come back very quickly. 
And I think it was due to a couple of reasons. One is that they don't kick as well as typical kids do, and you need that kicking to kind of stretch out the ankles. And the other thing is that a lot of these kids have hip and knee contractures, so they, they wouldn't fit into those typical club foot braces. So we had to come up with something different. And this is what we came up with, uh, what we call a dual purpose AFO. So during the day, it's just a regular AFO that is molded in such a way as to try to hold the foot into a good position. And then at nighttime, we have these straps that come down to pull the foot up. Now, this is by no means perfect. It's better, I think, than the typical brace, but they still get relapses. And I'd start off by telling every parent that most likely your child is gonna have relapses. We're probably gonna have a cycle of having to do some casting that might be every one year, every three years, something like that. And then at a certain point in time, somewhere between eight and 12 years of age, the foot kind of gels out, it holds this position, and then we don't have to be worried about relapses. But here is Leia, uh, Leia, Leia, for example, so you can see what her feet look like when we started. And we got them all straightened out, straightened out her hips, and here she's up and walking. Here's a three-year-old boy who had, had no previous uh, treatment of his feet, but he was walking out. You see the thick calluses he has on the side of his feet there. So that's what his feet looked like before we started. And here he was after three months worth, it was a total of nine uh, casts and two synonymies, but we got his feet pretty nice and flat to the ground. He's had relapses, we've had to re uh, recast again, but he's always been able to keep his feet pretty flat to the ground. Here's a boy, he was either 10 or 12 when he was adopted. The, uh, the documents were a little bit uh, sketchy coming from China, but he'd actually had previous surgery before. This is what his feet looked like and he had never walked. But it took us a number of casts, I don't have, did I write down? No, I didn't write down. Uh, he had, I think, uh, it was about uh, nine or ten casts also. But then we got him straightened out, straightened out his hips and knees, and now he walks with crutches completely independently. Um, so the relapses are a common thing. Uh, and like we were saying, it's just one of those things that when they happen, we go back to recasting. And then I wait till the child is pretty much done growing to see if there are any residual things that we might need to correct so we can get the feet nice and comfortable from there on out. But what I try to avoid, or what I want to avoid is this. So this is a child that was sent to me at 15 years old, and I can't even name what bones are left in their foot. They've had so many surgeries, so many bones taken out, and now the only way that you can fix this is by doing a big surgery to cut through what's uh, left of the bones there to straighten things out. Now, there's a different kind of club foot also that we need to uh, talk about which is a like a club foot, but just a little differently shaped. So you notice that this foot here is just kind of pointing pretty much straight down, and it's got something of a, a big arch here. It doesn't have as much of that turning to the side as most club feet have. Uh, so we call that one the equinocavus club foot. So there's another example of it there. And what we're trying to do here is just get the foot to line up nice and straight to get flat to the ground. Uh, and what we tend to find is that uh, the toes on these feet are really tough because they always want to, whoa, one minute. Oh, we're in trouble. Well, I'm just going to go over, over time and somebody get upset at me. Um, uh, but so the toes on these feet are, tend to be the, the, the real problems here. Uh, there's a different way of, of treating these feet, and that's what we got to get out to everybody who treats kids with arthrogryposis and club feet, that these feet, you need to mold them differently or else you're going to get a bad relapse that's going to cause us trouble. But we can get these feet to get nice and flat and look nice and straight. Congenital vertical talus, this is the opposite of the club foot. The foot's kind of going off in a different direction. Instead of rolling inwards, it rolls outwards. Uh, and it's due to a dislocation between this bone here called the talus and this bone here called the navicular, where the two bones should be lining up like this, but instead the talus is pointing downwards and the navicular is sitting up here. Uh, and in the past, we do big operations to get this straightened out. Uh, but then this gentleman by name of uh, Dobbs came up with a different way of casting them. So we can actually get most of the correction in by casting. And then you come back and do a small operation about that big to line up those two bones that are dislocated, put a pin across it, and then you get the foot nice and corrected. So you have feet that look like these. And after that very small operation, you see the, the incision right over there. The foot looks nice and straight. Uh, now let's talk briefly about the hips here. So the hips either are contracted hips, meaning that they don't move very well, or they're dislocated hips, which means that they're out of socket. Um, if they're a mild contracture, there's a small procedure we can do by loosening up in the very front of the hip joint. Um, 
but the more typical ones are much more contracted. The hips are kind of bent up and turned to the outside. So it looks something like this, and there's no way that we can get these feet on the ground for this person to walk. So what we do instead is make a cut at the very top of the uh, hip bone, right at the top of the femur bone, make a cut right over here, leave the ball where it wants to be inside the socket, but bring the leg down to where we want it to be. So if this is our hips, ball and socket, this is the child with arthrogryposis, but we can't change the shape of or how the ball is inside the socket. So instead we cut the, the top of the thigh bone here, leave the ball where it wants to be, but bring the knee down to where we want it to be. So we're not changing how much the hip moves, we're just changing the direction that it moves in. That's what it looks like way after it's healed up. And here's my young girl up and walking. What about the dislocated hip? So traditional thinking was that if you had, whoops, if you had a hip out of joint, if it was only one hip, you could put it back in. If they're both out, it's just better on these kids to leave them out because they become stiff, they uh, would become um, painful. Um, and in fact, uh, it, only about 10 years ago, I still had my bosses telling me, oh, you shouldn't put these hips back in joint, even though I could show them kids who were up and walking with these hips. Uh, so it's taken a long time to change everybody's uh, viewpoint on these. And I'll bring it back to the fact that the people who said you shouldn't put the hips back in joint never actually saw that many kids with arthrogryposis. So there's different ways to put the hip back in, in joint, different incisions. You can either use one that's right in the front of the pelvis. I like using one that's kind of right here near the groin crease. It gives me nice access to the hip. So I can take a, a, a ball and put it back in the socket. Even when people say they're, when you look at the x-ray and go, oh, there is no socket, there's always a socket to put the ball back into. <coughs> and oftentimes what we have to do is take a little piece out of the femur bone to shorten that down to get the ball into the socket. So here's a little girl, Emily, we fixed her feet. There's her hips out of socket, we put them back in socket. And here are different pictures of her uh, showing us how well she gets around and her parents like to send me postcards when they go hiking on mountains. What about the knees? Well, the knees can come in two flavors also, the bent knee or the extended knee. Uh, so here's a child with extended knees. Um, and But these kids, when their knees are extended, they actually learn to walk quicker than the ones with the bent knees. The problem becomes when they get bigger and they don't sit very well because their legs are out in front of them. And so I usually look to hold off on treating them until they're somewhat older, although still trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. So sometimes if these kiddos will, with the, you see how this knee is hyperextended here, we'll do casting of the knee to try to get to bend or use Botox in the muscles in the front. Whoops. I didn't mean to go through it quite that fast. Uh, and one of the important things to realize is when they have these extended knees, usually the hips are also turned outward. So this knee is not pointing forwards here, this knee is pointing directly to the outside. And so when someone starts casting this foot to try to get it uh, into a better position, they try to bend the knee, you can sometimes bend this knee the wrong way. So again, here's the front of the knee, this is the side of the knee. So by accident, somebody made this into a very knock knee that had to get, uh, we had to treat surgically. So there's different ways to get the knees to bend. Usually it's a big surge we have to do along the side of the thigh to uh, loosen up the muscles there to get the knee to bend. Uh, and I tend to look, like to do that as a roller. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah, okay, minus five. All right, I could probably make it, we'll go in the next five minutes here. Talk a little bit about knees that are bent now. Uh, so different ways of treating these knees. Uh, this is for the, the mildly bent knee. At a, uh, that's something that has less than 40 degrees of flexion contracture. What we're trying to do is slow the knee joint from, oh darn it, slow this down, slow the growth plate at the bottom of the knee from growing in front while it keeps growing in back. So if this is the thigh bone, this is the shin bone, here's your knee and here's the growth plate. If I can slow the growth plate from growing in front, let it keep on growing in back, then I'm gonna kind of fake a straight knee like this. And the way that we do that is by tethering the growth plate with these little plates that we put in here. So if you look at the before and after pictures, and the red lines there are showing you where the growth plate is, and you see how much that growth plate is tilted because we slowed it down from growing in front, and that's what allows the knee to become straight. What about for the more severe contractures? Those are more than 40 degrees. What do I do for those? And usually these days is more for the ones that are about 50 degrees. So when somebody who's done growing, I'll do this. I'll cut the thigh bone and acutely straighten out the knee. So again, we're faking a straight knee 
but this, this time we're doing it by cutting just above the knee to straighten it out. So we have this young man here. That uh, was a video of him walking, but that's okay. Um, and what we did with him is just cut the bone, straighten it out, and now he walks with short leg braces. Uh, don't want to do that in somebody who's grown because what will end up happening is that when they grow, their growth plate will want to straighten itself out. So here's somebody made about a 60 degree straightening of the knee, but a year later, the knee had gone back to where it was because that growth plate just wanted to straighten itself out. So instead, what I do is I'll use uh, what's called an Elizaroff external fixator. It's pins that go through skin into bone, and we'll do that above and below the knee itself with these little hinges at the knee joint, and then this big outrigger here to slowly straighten out the knee. So there's a the knee, there's it the, with the fixator on. There's that outrigger that we were talking about that we're going to slowly uh, draw the two sides together and we'll get the knee to straighten out. So there it is straightened out. So here's a young man before, here he is after. Uh, here's Daryl. Uh, we straightened out his feet. We took his, straightened out his hips. There isn't his cast after his hips. And then here's his knees. Here he is dancing. Here he is taking his first, uh, or some, one of his first independent steps across his living room. Daryl's now 10. Here's Simon, kind of a similar picture, similar story. And I'll say, I don't know if he was angry at me or if he was just Halloween, it was Halloween. Uh, and then here he is walking. Come on, do it for me. Nope, he's not going to do it for me. Sorry about that. Um, but in short, I just want to say that it is a privilege.